Hi, welcome to your neighborhood pharmacy. Hi, I've got a prescription for diabetes test strips. How much is the copay? Well, it depends on your type of commercial insurance and factoring in your yearly spend, subtracting the deductibles, also depending on your monthly Ugh, allowance. Why can't there be a better option? Or you could try Contour Next test strips, a 35 counts only $19.99 over the counter and proven to be highly accurate. Go to contournext.com slash radio to see if over the counter strips are a more affordable option for you. Hmm, I think I'll try Contour Next. At Acuity Insurance, we know the best decisions come from the heart. So let your heart take the lead. We'll protect it with ours. Find business, home, and auto insurance at acuity.com. Acuity, a mutual insurance company and other companies. Not all products available in all states. Bambi by Felix Sultan. Chapter 9. Leaves were falling from the big oak at the edge of the meadow. They were falling from all the trees. One of the branches of the oak was much higher up than the others. It stretched a long way out over the meadow. At its tips, there were sat two leaves together. These aren't like they used to be, said one of the leaves. They ain't, said the other, other answered. There yeah, were well, so many of us last night who we were just about the only ones left here on this branch. You never know who's going to Atman to, to next, to the first. Even when it was wise and warm, and the sunshine gave you some heat. You get a storm or cloud burst sometimes, and lots of us get torn off them then. Even them, they were still young. You never know who's going to ha- happen to next. You don't, you don't get much sunshine these days, the second leaf side. Even when the sun does shine, there's no strength to it. And you've got to get your strength from what, from somewhere else. Do you think it's true, pondered the first, is it true that other leaves will come along and take your place once we're gone, and then another lot, and then another lot? Of course it's true, whispered the second. Only we can't work out how. It's above that we can't un- we, that we can understand. That's it. It makes you really sad and all, the first added. He remained silent for a while. Then the first said quietly to himself, What do you have to go away for anyway? The second answered, What happens to us after we've fallen? We sink down. And that, what is it? What's down there? The first answered, I don't know. Some say one thing, others say something different. Nobody knows really. The second answered, Do you think you really feel anything? Do you think you know anything about yourself when you're down there? The first answered, who can say none of them have gone down there has ever come back to tell us? As, uh, they were again silent for a while. The first leaf said tenderly to the other, don't get yourself all upset about it here. You're shivering, look. Oh, don't bother about that, the second answered. Anything makes me shiver these days. You kind of just don't feel properly attached to where you are, do you? You better stop talking about things like that, said the first leaf. Yeah, we better leave it, the other replied. Only, what are we going to talk about that now then? They became silent. After a short time, resumed its subject. Do you think, who do you think is going to be the first of us to go down there then? You won't be for a while yet, the first assured him. Let's... Let's just think about how beautiful it used to be, how wonderful, beautiful. When the sun came out and burned us so hot, it seemed we'd just swell up with all the good health it gave us, remember? And then there was a drew early in the morning and lime trees, wonderful nights. The nights are horrible now, well, why in the second? They never seem to come to an end. We can't complain, said the first leaf gently. We live together. We lived longer than so many others. Have I changed much? The second leaf asked, shyly but emphatically. Not a bit, the first assured him. Well, because I've got all yellow and ugly. Now it's, it's got a bit different for me. Oh, give over, the second contra- contradicted. No ice, the first repeated emphatically. It's true, that's what I'm telling you. You're lovely as you were on the very first day. Might be a few yellow stripes here and there. Not so they notice, but you, they just make you look all the lovelier, honest. Oh, thank you, the second leave whispered, feeling quite touched. I'm not sure I believe you. Well, not everything, but not 
Well, not everything, but thank you for it. You are good to me. You always have been. If not, if only in it, now that I start to understand how good you always been to me. I'll stop it now, said the first, and became silent himself. He could not talk any more because he was upset. Now they are both silent. The hours passed, a dim, down wind blew cold and hostile through the treetops. Oh, now, said the second leaf. I, his voice broke off. He was gently removed from his place and fluttered down to the earth. Winter had come. Chapter 10. Bambi noticed that the world had changed. It was hard for him to get by in this altered world. It had been all, they had all been living like rich people, and now they began to find themselves in poverty. A wealth was all that Bambi had ever known. He took it as a matter of course to be surrounded by the greatest access and lu- find his luxuries on all sides. To have no worry about finding food or sleeping in a beautiful room home with green that no one could see into. And to walk about in a majestically smooth, glossy red coat. Everything was different now. He had not really noticed it, not properly. The change which had taken place had been, for him, just a sequence of short-lived appearances. He found it entertaining when milky white veils of mist drew the morning darkness up from the meadow, or when the, they would suddenly sink down from the twilight sky. It was so beautiful they dissipated. In the moon sunlight, he saw the f- they liked the frost too, which surprised him. He saw the ground and the meadow strewn with white. He spent much time luxurating in the sound of his grown up relatives, the stags, as they shouted. A whole forest would rumble from the voices of these kings. Bambi would listen and be very afraid. His heart would thump in an admiration. Whenever he heard the thunderous call, he thought about the crowns worn by these kings. So big as with so many branches, like a majestic oak, he would think their voices were just as powerful as their crowns. Their imperious commands rolled out in the deepest tones, the monstrous groans, and the blood as it rushed around their bodies and seed. The ancient power, yearning haughtiness and pride. Whenever Bambi heard these voices, he felt overwhelmed by them. But he was proud to have such distinguished relatives. At the same time, he felt. A peculiar, incited irritation of their, at their being so unapproachable that hurt him, that humiliated him. Although he did not know exactly why or how, or even how he could come any closer to or to knowing. It was only then, when the king's time for lovemaking was over and their thunderous cries went silent, that Bambi started praying attention, paying attention to other things once more. When he walked through the woods by night or lay in his room by day, he heard the whispings of leaves as they fell down from the trees, the rustling sounds as they trickled down from the air from every tree top, every twig were incessant. A gentle slippery light of the moon ran continuously down to the earth. It was wonderful to wake up to it. It was delicious to go to sleep with this mysterious sad whispering. The leaves at that time lay deep and loose on the ground. When you walked through them, they crackled loudly, they rustled quietly. It was fun to have to push them aside with each step because their layers were so deep. They made a shh noise that was very fine, very light and silvery. This was also very useful, as during these times, with no need to make great effort with listening and smelling. Everything could be heard from a long way off. The leaves rustled with the slightest movement. They cried out, shh. Who could possibly sneak up on you? No one. But then came the rain. From early morning to late in the evening, it poured down. It struck and splattered from late in the evening. And all through the night, it took black to the morning. Eased off a little while, when then began again with a new strength. The air seemed full of cold water. The whole well seemed full of it. Your mouth was filled with water. If you only tried to gather a few blades of grass, if you pulled at a brush, you would the water would gush down to your eyes and up your nose. These and the ground no longer rustled. They lay there soft and heavy, pressed down by the rain, and made no sound at all. Bambi, for the first time, learned how vexing it was to have water streaming down on you all through the day and all through the night and to be soaked to the skin. He was still not very cold, but he yearned for warmth, and he thought it was miserable to have to move about warm. 
soaked through and through. And but then, when the stormy weather came down from the north, Bammy learned it really meant what it really means to be cold. It was a little help to cuddle up close to his mother. First, of course, he liked it very much to lie there, be nice and warm. But he's on one side. The stormy winds raged all through the night and all through the day, and all through the forest. He would be driven by an incomprehensible, icy, cold fury and insane rage and wanted to tear all the trees up by the roots, carrying them away to, to, or destroy them in some other way. Trees roared as they put up a powerful resistance. He fought bravely against this immense attack. You could hear their long, drawn-out groans and sighs of their creaking. There's a loud bang, then one of their mighty barrows split. The angry crack when here and there the trunk of a tree would break. The cry of pain from all its wounds. Body was overpowered, split and killed. But then it became impossible to hear anything once. Anything more as the storm fell into the forest. With even greater violence, it roars and drowned out any other voice. Bami now understood what, that a period of need and poverty had begun. He saw how much the rain and storms had changed the world. There, no, there was now no leaves or any of the trees or on any of the trees or bushes. They stood there robbed of all they had. Their whole body was naked. It could be clearly seen. They looked pitiful. They stretched their naked brown arms up to the sky. The grass in the meadow was limp and dark brown and so short it seemed to have burnt to the ground. The place where Bambi and his mother slept seemed pitiful and bare now. Since its green walls had disappeared, it offered no privacy. The wind blew in from every side. One day a young magpie flew over the meadow. Something white and cold fell into her eye. Then another, then another laid a light veil over her sight. Little soft, dazzling white flakes were dancing all around her. The magpie flapped, flapped her wings and nearly stopped, but then directed herself upward and went higher into the sky. In the sky, in vain, the soft cold flakes were there again and again. They fell into her and into her eyes. Once again, she directed herself upward and rose even louder, higher. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just don't bother, love, cried the crow, called the crow who was above her, who was flying in the same direction. Just give up. You can't fly high enough to get out of those fakes. That's snow, isn't it? Snow, said the magpie in amazement as she struggled against each flurry that came at her. Well, yeah, said the crow. Wind is here. That's snow, that is. Forgive me, answered the crook magpie. I only left the nest in May. I don't know what what winter's like. Yeah, there's a lot of that, the crow observed. You'll soon find that out, though. Well, if this, that was, if that's what snow is, for the magpie, I'd like to sit down for a little while. She went down and sat on a twig on the other tree and shook herself. The crow flew lazily on. First, Bambi was pleased to see the snow. The air was still mild and white stars floated in the sky. Everything in the world looked entirely new. It became lighter, even gayer, thought Bambi. And for brief years, when the sun came out, everything lit up. The white covering sparkled and shone with such power. It was quite dazzling. But Bambi soon stopped being pleased about the snow, as it was coming harder and harder to find food. He had to scrape and snow the snow inside and look, took a look up it took that took a lot of effort before a small patch of limp grass was exposed the snow cut into your legs too so you had to be careful not to get your feet injured Gober already had done but of course that was what Gober was like he was never able to endure very much he caused his mother a lot of worry they were together now for almost all the time and they also had more company than previously Edna would often call up, call by with her children. But Lorena, a girl who was nearly grown up, they also began to mix in a circle. But it was probably old Mrs. Nickley who became up by with a chat most often. She was quite alone and opinion about everything. Now, she said, I want you to have nothing more to do, children. That's a pleasure that I've really had enough of. And Philaen would always say, "What? Mom. That? That? What? Why that? Mom. That then? When it's Mom. a pleasure." And Mrs. Nettle would pretend to be cross and say, "It's a bad sort of pleasure. I've had enough of it. Everyone's enjoying chatting very much." They sat 
next to each other and talked. The children had never had to listen had to listen to so much as much had so much the children had never had so much to listen to. Even one or two of the princes came and kept company with them. At first it felt a little awkward, especially as the children were still somewhat shy with them. They that passed quite quickly when there there was a pleasant atmosphere. Bambi admired Prince Ronono, who was an impressive gentleman. He felt a tremendous love for the young, beautiful Clarice. They had cast off their crowns and Bambi could often stare at a two round slate grey disc on their heads with glamorous splendour and in many tender points that could be seen. Catarus seemed very elegant and distinguished. It's tremendously exciting when one of the princes would tell him about what had happened to him on Rono's left foreleg. There was a big bump which has now over, outgrown with fur. He would ask, often ask, Have you ever noticed how I limp on this leg? Everyone's prompt to assure him that no one had ever noticed any limp at all. That was what Rono wanted to hear. It really was true to say it was barely noticeable. Yes, he would continue. I escaped from everything very dangerous. The very, from, I escaped from something very dangerous that day. So Rono would go on to account. Had you been taken by surprise by him and hurled him, hurled fire at him? He was not, he, he was only hit there on the leg. It hurt so much he could ma- drive you mad. But it was only here on his leg that he had been hit. Hit nearly, nearly enough to drive him crazy. No wonder a bone had been shattered. But Rono did not pack it, panic. You know, he got up and went on just three legs. He kept going despite the pain. He is well aware that he was being chased. He ran and ran until night fell. He himself allowed himself some rest. The following morning he moved on again until he felt he was in safety. Then he groomed himself, hidden and alone, and waited for the wound to close up. When she came out of his place of safety, he was a hero. He had a limp that was barely noticeable. Now when they was all together in one place, so often for so long, when so many stories were told, Bambi heard more about him than he ever had before. He told about how horrible he was to look at. Nobody could bear looking into his pale face. This was something that Bambi already knew from his own experience. They would even talk about the smell of him that spread all around, and here too, Bambi would have been able to contribute to the discussion if he had not been too well brought up to join in conversations with grown-ups. He said the scent, the scent was of a rather puzzling sort, always changing but instantly recognisable. It is always remarkably stimulating, undeniable, mysterious, but in itself rather disgusting. They talked about him only needed two legs to walk on, about the wonderful strength of both his hands. Some of them had, did not exactly know what hands were, but then Miss Nettley explained it to them. I don't see anything surprising about it. A squirrel can do anything you just mentioned, and does it just the way he wants to. Every little mouse can do the same. You point, turned her head disrespectfully away from them. Oh, the others exclaimed, and he made her understand it's far from being the same thing. But Mr. Ledley was not to be intimidated. What about the falcon, she declared. What about the buzzard and the owl? They've only got two legs. And when they want to make, take hold of something, if you call it, they can stand on one leg and hold it with another. That's a lot harder to do, I'm sure. He can't do it. Miss Nettley was not in any way inclined to admire anything about him. She hated him with all her heart. He's disgusting, she said. And nothing would change her mind. There was nobody who contradicted her. And there was nobody who found him very, very lovable. But the matter became even more confusing. They talked about it, saying he had a third hand. Not just two hands, but a third hand as well. Miss Lady's reply was cut. It's just an old wife's tale, she concluded. I didn't believe it. Now, Ronald joined in. So what? he asked. And what do you think it was? He used to, sh- he used to shut up my leg. Just tell me what you, that, will you? Miss Lady gave a grip report, talk, talked. It's him, it's your affair, my dear love. He's never shut at anything of mine. Aren't they never s- said? I've seen lots of different things in my life. I think there must be something in it if he insists he's got a third hand. 
Young Krauss observed politely. I can only agree with you, La. The crow is a friend of mine. He stopped in embarrassment for a short while and looked at all the people. Yeah, there, as if he was afraid of being laughed at. But when he saw they were all listening to him and giving him all the attention, he continued, The crow is exceptionally talented. I can't deny that. She's astonishingly talented. You told me that he really does have three hands. Not all the time. It's just that the third hand, the crow told me, was that a nasty one. It doesn't grow it doesn't grow out of him like the other two. He carries it hanging his shoulder. The crow says he she could always tell when he or of these kind is dangerous or not. If he's going on coming if he's long comes along without that third hand, then he isn't dangerous. Miss Emily laughed. This crow of yours is just stupid colorous. Take it from me, my love. If she was as clever as she thinks she is, she'll know that he's always dangerous, always. But the others have something to say, too. There, there are some of them who are not dangerous at all, Bambi's mother thought. You can see it straight away. So what? asked Mrs. Asked Mrs. Nettler. Do you just stand there till they come up to you and say hello to them? Bambi's mother answered softly. Of course I just don't stand there. I run away. And Felaine burst out with, you should always run away. Everybody laughed. They began to talk about his third hand. As he did so, it became more serious and a sense of horror came among them. Whatever it was, a, a third hand or something different, it was something terrible, something they could not understand. Most of them knew about it from when what they had been told by the others. But some of them then had seen it with their own eyes. He would stand there a long way off without moving. He had no way of explaining what he or the, how he ha- how it happened, but it would suddenly be a bang like thunder, fire sprayed out, and then even at a distance from him, he you would collapse with your breast torn open, and he would die. Or they all lowered their heads, or she told them, this is as if they were pressed down by some dark force, had some inexplicable power over them. They listened eagerly to the many different accounts of seeing him. Every story was full of horror, full of blood and suffering. It took all this, this in. I still wanted to hear more. There was were being said stories that must have been made up. All the fairy tales and legends that they heard from their grandfathers and great grandfathers. They listened. They unconsciously learned, while well, still afraid, about how to make peace with this dark world, or at least to run away from it. What does that mean? Asked young Crellerus, quite dispirited. dispirited. That he can go far away and still knock you down. Don't you, oh, don't you, oh, don't you, clever crow, explain that to you? Didn't your clever crow explain that to you? said Mrs. Benetola. No, said Krauss with a smile. She always says she's often seen it, but no one knows how to explain it. Well, he can knock off down the crows down with a tree. He feels like it, as over run home. He knocks at pleasants away from the sky, Aunt Linda added. Bammy's mother said, He throws his hand out there. That's what my granddaughter t- mother told me. Does he really? Miss Annette asked. And what is it that makes you all that horrible, tremendous, thunderous noise then? When his hand tears itself away from his body, Bammy's mother explained, there's a flash of fire that makes a bang like thunder. On the inside, that's all. He, he is just fire. Excuse me, said Rollo. This is so truthful in saying he's nothing but fire on the side. It's wrong to say it's his hand. He uses a strike from form of a hand could cause injuries like that. You can see it for yourself. It's much more likely to be a tooth. It carries throws at us. Think about it. It'll explain a lot. So you die because he bites you. Young Catrus breathed a sigh. sigh. Well, he never stopped chasing us down. The marina and marina age spoke. The girl, now nearly an adult. That means that one day you'll come and join us, be as gentle as we are. You'll play games with us. Everyone in the forest will be happy. We'll make peace together. Miss Nettie shrieked with laughter. Is it possible if he just stays where he is and leaves us alone? You shouldn't say things like that, Aunt Edna admonished her. And why not then? retorted Miss Nettie as she became more heated. There's nothing real. There's nothing. Isn't there something not? That's really not something I could imagine. Make a piece of him. Been murdering us for long. Been able to think. 
our sisters, our mothers, and our brothers. But if, uh, all the time he'd been in his world, he never leaves us in peace. He kills us whenever he sees us. And you want to make peace of him? That's just so stupid. Marina looked at everyone with her gently sparkling eyes wide open. There's nothing stupid about making peace, she said. We've got to make peace. I'm going to get something to eat, said Mrs. Medley. She turned round and ran off. Today, I want to tell you about a simple way to get all the entertainment you love without the hassle. DirecTV Stream brings your live TV and on-demand favorites together like never before, which means you can watch your favorite sports, movies, and shows all in one place. And the best part? There's no annual contract. So stop waiting and get your TV together with DirecTV Stream. You can learn more at directtv.com. That's directtv.com. Compatible device required. Content varies by package. Hi, welcome to your neighborhood pharmacy. Hi, I've got a prescription for diabetes test strips. How much is the copay? Well, it depends on your type of commercial insurance and factoring in your yearly spend, subtracting the deductibles, also depending on your monthly Ugh, allowance. Why can't there be a better option? Or you could try Contour Next Test Strips, a 35 counts only $19.99 over the counter and proven to be highly accurate. Go to contournext.com slash radio to see if over the counter strips are a more affordable option for you. Hmm, I think I'll try Contour Next. <laughs> 